Morning, everybody. Happy Sunburnt Mondays and welcome to the News Agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by my fellow Mirror columnist and associate editor, Kevin McGuire. Morning, Kev. Morning, Foxy. Happy Monday. Yeah, um, this is a people's pay-per-view. So get into the comments, ask us your questions. We'll do our best to deal with them for you. Those of you listening later on podcast will just have to defect to the other side and see if there's any associated punishment that might come with that. So what have we got for you today? Well, the Mirror has splashed on an investigation into capital gains tax paid by Tory MPs on the sale of their homes. Exactly the scandal the Tories have been trying to brew over Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rain over the past few months. And more on that in a little bit. But first, I want to take us to the very bottom of Kevin's column and indeed the entirety of today's letters page in the Mirror. Um, and in, in your column, Kevin, you're, you quote Labour bigwig Wes Streeting saying that if Liz Truss were to offer to defect from the Tories, he'd rather take the lettuce. Now, this is, of course, the continuing fallout from last week's surprise defection by the hard right winger Natalie Elphick, who's basically this country's Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, to the Labour Party in a move which just shocks an awful lot of people in Westminster. It's a bit like Trump's top cheerleader suddenly declaring for Joe Biden, like what's going on? This unease, Kevin, it's not going away, is it? Like Wes has kind of shown there, there's a lot of unease within the Labour Party, within in Parliament about this. And the letters page is showing there's an awful lot of unease in the in the general population that don't quite understand how this has happened or what the what the benefit is to to the Labour Party. And the revelations over the weekend almost make me think that they might be about to have to kick her back out again. What's the what's the latest on this defection and what Natalie elphick has been up to? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they won't do that, uh, Foxy. And it's, it's quite interesting. The Conservative Party were quite happy to have her when they knew everything about her. But they <laughs> turned away. And but it becomes an issue when she goes to Labour. But in Labour, and on the left, and you're right, the letters page uh, reflects that in the Daily Mirror, which I think is a reasonable um, uh, take uh, barometer of public, uh, public opinion because people have to, you know, t- you have to get a bit of paper, you have to write or type and, Fold it up, put it in an envelope, stamp, you know, one pound thirty-five or anything like it's not just doing a tweet or an email, however valuable they are. And of course, you know, as you say, it's a people's paper review, and you want people to interact. Um, but the the position is she's it, there's a feeling she's a Tory too far. Because one, on so many issues, she was incredibly hard right. She was on uh, migration, um, attacking Keir Starmer as so softy. She was also very anti-trade union after p sacked hundreds of workers in Dover so they could hire foreign labour a lot cheaper. She was attacking the, the RMT and it was all p and it could go on and on and on. And I can't see a journey she's been on, on over any period of time, which you do get with some people they, when they defect. The last Labour MP to de- defect directly to the Conservative Party in Westminster wasn't uh, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, recent. It was 1977 when Reg Prentice moved. But in this parliament, you've had two other MPs have defected from the Tories to Labour. You've had Christian Wakeford. I can see why he did that, because he, he's up in uh, Bury. Uh, he was, for instance, he, he thought the, the law should be changed on fire and rehire, where people get the sack and then they're taken on back on low terms. I heard him and I thought, blimey. You can, you know, you could be in the Labour Party with that view. Dan Polar, doctor, he sees what's happened to the NHS. But with Natalie Helfick, I just do not see the journey she's been on there. Starmer's taken her because he thinks, right, she was on the right. If I can convince, as he would put it, somebody on the right, that on defence and, and migration, we're better than the Tories. Every time the Tories can attack me, I can say, well, you know, Natalie Helfick used to think that. Now she's, now she's with us. 
Mm. Um, so I, I get I get it, but I think I would say most Labour MPs and most members of the Shadow Cabinet would not have taken her. And I think it would have said a lot in politics if you could say, no, I'm, I'm not going to have her now. Wes Streeton and his Liz Truss letters, I'd rather have the letters joke. He's basically, there's a truth in it, <laughs> but he's also using humour as a distraction. Mm. Because somebody like him, and he's considered to be on the Blairite right of Labour, he wasn't consulted, but he must feel uneasy about having her as a colleague. And it sits ill with a lot of them when other people are being suspended and kicked out of the Labour Party, yeah. like Diane Abbott. Yeah, I suppose still... the only benefit really is that her, they've only got to put up with her for a couple of months. You know, yeah, what you've got to lose. Part of the Labour Party for very long. You're right. Look, I'm, I'm sure, well, I, I'm not sure, I would suggest this is why she's she shifted. She was going to lose that seat. Labour are odds on to win Dover and Deal and have a very good candidate, X Forces. And she was going to, she's going to lose. Now, she says she's standing down. I reckon she's standing down because she knew she was going to lose. And this yeah. is before we get on to the murky, sordid business of her husband. Remember, she took the seat in 2019 because her husband was accused and com then subsequently convicted of sexual assaults. Yeah, while, she, while running around the house semi-naked shouting, I'm a naughty Tory, for those of yeah. you. Those, that's the bit most people would remember. Yeah, and then she had she had a pop at the victim, saying, oh, yeah, because an MP is attractive to people. I mean, oh, dear, she turns your stomach. Now, Robert Buckland, the Justice Secretary, told me, Justice Secretary, he says that she tried to lobby, well, she lobbied him, to try and get the judges changed in the in the case, go to a lower pro profile court. Now, I've got many political differences with Robert Buckland. I've, I've clashed with him on TV before, but I don't believe he's a liar on something mm -hmm. like that. I just don't. I don't believe it. Now she says it's all nonsense, but I would I would take Buckland's word on this. Now the Tories must have been aware of that before. And they've just not bothered about it. So I feel there is an element of double standards and hypocrisy when they say it's a problem for Labour when they were quite happy to go along with it. Exactly. Themselves. It's like saying, well, you don't want this MP. She's awful. But she was yours five minutes ago. And that's she was right. handing out that's your right. leaflets and everything else. Now, what do you think, everybody? Do you think there's a problem still that is dragging on from Natalie Elphick's defection? Do you think his Starmer should have been a bit more careful about who he was letting in? Or do you think it does actually work electorally just to have her in the party for a couple of months to really sort of, you know, um, make the party look strong on immigration in some way. Adrian says, we just need a general election now. Yes, well, we all agree with you there, Adrian. Um, now, it's amazing that the Tories were so upset by Natalie Elphick trying to rig her husband's sex assault trial that they waited the whole four years mm -hmm. before they made this public. Crouchy says she should be jailed for life and Starmer throw away the key. I'm not sure what we'd be jailing her for, <laughs> but uh, just general principle. Yeah. All right, yeah. Um, do you think, I mean, this is really, Kevin, I suppose, it's being treated a bit like a punishment beating, isn't it? The, the Tories are kind of, it's a warning to other defectors. Anyone else who's thinking of crossing the floor, we're going to dredge up everything. And, you know, the Tory party, the whips have got everything on these guys for years. We're yeah. gonna, if you defect, you're going to get a load of mud flung at you. And although it may make the Tory party look bad to some extent, it's going to make Labour, or make that MP look even worse, isn't it? Yeah, well, well, things were said by the Tories about Christian Wakeford and Dan Poulter that for legal reasons couldn't be repeated. Uh, and uh, I think, yes, that's that's what they will do. Now, Labour's said to be discussing you know, potential defections with three of the Tories, including ex-ministers. Probably you know, not anymore. All part, yeah, all parties play this up. But I would have thought the Elphic experience, uh, the reaction within Labour, also, the public reaction and the mud throwing from the Conservative Party itself might make some people think twice if they've, you know, they've got bits in their private life or their public life that uh, they're not entirely proud of and they don't want waved around and debated. I mean, that's that's the that's the intention. Yeah. But um, one Tory MP who's in the One Nation centrist grouping now, she you know, she was on the hard right, as you say, the Conservative Party. She was, you know hanging around with the headbangers. In fact, he was one of the headbangers. But there's a One Nation Tory MP, so it's the first time he can remember where an MP's defected and those who've been left behind are happier than those who are receiving the defecting MP. Uh, and I think there is a, a you know genuine truth 
in that. I think I think Labour's made a mistake. They'll try and make the best of a bad job now. I can see what their goal was and why they might even think they're still ahead on it. But if you're going to talk about changing politics and having higher standards in public life, I think Labour would then need to be, as, as Neil Kinnock, the former leader, put it, choosy on who it yeah. takes. And it and sits all easily when there are people on the left of Labour being suspended and kicked out mm. uh, that somehow somebody on the hard right is embraced. Yeah, it's going to cause Starmer perhaps some internal problems. I can't help thinking that if Natalie Offit was a, a Labour MP and she has been accused of trying to rig a, a husband's sex assault trial, that she might be automatically suspended. But actually, it's not going to happen now yeah. because she'll be an MP later. Now, if uh, GM Lovely says, if that's the case, he sat in his information for four years, did nothing, but now she's left for Labour. He's singing like a bird about it. Exactly the point we are making. I suppose the question is, Kevin, where does this go next? You know, so we've got at least supposedly three more MPs in talks to defect or now thinking twice about it. It does seem like there's a lot of Tory MPs who are quite disaffected by things. Nadim Zahawi resigned last week as well to spend more time with his taxable assets. Are we going to see more defections, more resignations? And if so, do you have any rough idea who they might be? I think we'll see more MPs deciding they're not going to stand at the general election. Uh, Conservatives, one, because they m may fear they're going to lose their own seat. Or two, they can see quite clearly the Conservative Party is going into opposition. So if you've been a minister, you're not going to be a minister anymore. Do you just want the hard grind of five, potentially ten years out? Uh, so they, they go. As for as for defections, I don't know, in, in truth. Parties, when they're on a, on a roll, always talk it up. Um, who Labour talked it up after Dan Poulter. And hey, presto, uh, Natalie Elphick does... Yeah. Do you know what? Suella Bradman today is talking about child poverty and free school meals. Maybe she's on a journey, Kev, and Suella will be the next one to knock on Keir's door. Would he let her in, do you think? That would be a glorious <laughs> test, wouldn't it? You, know, you see, they, I suppose the, the truth is, if somebody has a genuine journey or Damascene conversion very suddenly and can show I was wrong and disown and say, look, I apologise for everything they did in the past. Mm. You know, Suella Braverman says, look, when I, I said my dream was to put some money on a flight to Rwanda, uh, I was actually wrong, and I was in the grip of this hard right bigoted mania, and I'm better now. I'm taking the pills, or I've seen a psychiatrist, or I actually I'm talked to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, if, that, if that happened, and they explained it, then I think, yeah, you could. You could then. <laughs> but when it's when it just feels very cynical and opportunist, mm -hmm. nah. Yeah, as I I feel very sorry for the people of Dover, um, which is a constituency where my grandparents lived for a long time. My mother grew up. It was eighty three percent likely to turn Labour, only seventeen percent voting Tory, and we all got deprived of the election night sight of Natalie Elphick being booted to the curb. Um, and I think there's a number of constituencies where we're going to be deprived of that sort of Portillo moment. So I think that's the main thing that she's probably walked away from and that we've all lost out on as a result. But of course, mm -hmm. that's the gaiety of the nation in general, doesn't it? I'm just going to keep my eye on Suella. I think we might have lost the trend here. Now... Is she your outside tip, Foxy? <laughs> now, on to the main story of the day. And it's uh, an investigation by our colleague Nick Summerlad into Tory MPs who sold a house and they now have questions to answer about whether or not they paid capital gains tax on it or if they should. Now, Kevin, can you take us through this a bit? Because most of us, if we sell up, you know, you don't have to worry about capital gains tax. Why might these Tories have to do exactly that? Yeah, if you... If you... Uh, sell the home you live in and it's your main home you don't pay capital gains tax if you've got second third fourth homes and you sell them you do pay capital gains tax uh, the Tories have gone after Angela Rayner because she sold uh, the former council house she bought uh, 2015 and they've come up with calculations saying oh she should have been uh, eligible for 1500 pounds council tax now she says no it was where I where I lived uh, so I didn't have to pay capital gain, capital gain tax. But they've gone and gone and gone and said, produce the evidence. Where is it? Show us everything. And the police have launched an inquiry under Tory lobbying. The uh, chief constable of uh, Greater Manchester uh, buckled under the pressure of the, the Tories. I'm sure it's nothing to do with him going to speak at a very hard right 
fringe meeting at a Tory conference. I'm sure it's nothing to do that. That's no indication of where he's coming at all. That's peripheral, you know, collateral information I didn't need to tell you. I'm sure there's nothing to do with it. Anyway, he's launched this uh, launched this inquiry, and the Tories will say, come on, come clean, show all your evidence. Well, Nick Summerlad, our uh, you know, super sleuth investigations uh, editor, has gone four Tories who sold houses they bought with taxpayers' money because it used to be, until after the expense of scandal change in 2010, you could buy a house and claim the mortgage interest relief as on your expenses, and then when you sold the house, you could pocket the gain. But he's asked four of them who made big gains, 5.4 million between them, whether they paid capital gains tax. None of them will say. None of them say. David Trudenic, profit 2 million or so. Eleanor Lang, Deputy Speaker at the moment, profit 0.6 million, won't say. Shalish Vara, 1.6 million profit, won't say. Maria Miller, former culture minister, profit 1.2 million, won't say. Now, no and even have broken the law, but they will not say. And yet they keep putting all this pressure on Angela Rayner, Labour's deputy leader. Go on, produce documents, show everything. Well, hang on. Sunak, he's done raise it twice in Prime Minister's questions. Well, maybe he should be calling in his MPs, one's a former MP now, and actually finding out whether they've put their own house, see what I've done there, their own house in order. Yeah, well, exactly. And so you've got this situation where if you have a um, if you have a home that is the second home that, and this is what they've been trying to prove about Angela Rayner, isn't it, over the past month? So that they, that basically that she wasn't living there; she was living with her husband down the road in a different house, and that she was somehow bilking the taxpayer for the for the enormous crushing sum of fifteen hundred, maybe as much as three thousand pounds, because when she sold it. It, it was not her official main home. And they're saying that it was actually her second home. And so therefore, there was a dodge. But with these MPs, because they flipped their primary and secondary home designations for purposes of claiming parliamentary expenses, they have done the taxpayer, perhaps, for far more because they, yeah. they had to flip it in order to claim the yeah. mortgage interest, and then they, you know, it depends which way the flip was, where you had to pay capital gains tax when you sold it. Yeah, if the, the, the they, they may not have flipped, because flipping was when you just change for financial advantage, your designation. So they may, they may have always just said, look, this is the you know, the house I'm claiming, on because my main residence is elsewhere, either. Well, in that case, if they were being honest, they paid capital gains tax and they could tell us, couldn't they? Yeah, yeah, well, no, that's right. And look, Angela Rayner paid her own mortgage. Taxpayers didn't pay Angela Rayner a mortgage. She was at the time, she was a, a low paid carer. I mean, like a, she's a great British success story. The you know, the the woman from a very difficult home with a mentally ill uh, mother who fed them cat food. Uh, they had to go to their uh, nanas to have a bath at the weekend. Uh, she leaves school at 16, no qualifications, a baby on its way. She you know, gets a job, works our way up, absolutely fantastic. But the, there's been a lot of snobbery in the attacks on her. You can see how it is motivated by them. But these, these Tories, they bought their ha these houses, their houses, with our money, taxpayers' money. And they will not say whether they paid capital gains. Uh, now, you might say, and Maria Miller, former Culture Secretary, Hampshire MP, she says, well, it's a long-standing convention. MPs don't have to talk about their personal tax affairs. Well, okay, that's a long-standing convention. Why are you Tory hounds going after Angela Rayner the way you are? The hypocrisy then just becomes absolutely glaring. All right? Some of the questions uh, of Angela Rayner, I wouldn't object to as a journalist. I think they're, they can be legitimate, but there's a sense of proportionality and also, why do they keep going on at her in this this way? And yeah. we know why they do it. They're just doing it for party political purposes to try and damage her, undermine her. The Tory party has been absolutely riddled with sleaze. Here we've got a Tory MP standing down because bad people had to be paid six and a half grand in the middle of the night to free them. We Blackpool South by-election was gained by Labour, lost by the Tories because basically the MP P, the Tory MP, had wanted money to um, help the gambling industry. You've had tractor porn. You've had lobbying. 
I mean, it just go on and on and on. You couldn't, you couldn't make it up. In fact, uh, the amount of who would make up tracks of tracks of porn? I mean, that that's that's a niche area. One would have thought. Brian yeah. thinks he knows why this is happening. Angela is a huge threat to the Tories, hence why they're doing everything they can to get her discredited. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what do you think? Do you think it matters whether these MPs and um, whether they've paid capital gains tax on a home that may have been their second or not? But it doesn't matter really whether their home is a council home in Stockport, like Angela had, or a million pound pad in London. The principle is, do you pay the capital gains tax or not? The other thing that's different here is Angela wasn't an MP at the time where she supposedly didn't pay capital gains tax. These people were MPs while they maybe didn't pay capital gains tax. John says the Tories just want to make everyone else as dirty as them. That's like the Boris Johnson trick, right? When Boris Johnson was editor of The Spectator, it became a sex-crazed, adulterous nest of vipers. When he was at um, Downing Street, it became the most immoral, rule-breaking address in the country. Wherever Boris Johnson goes, everyone around him just behaves so badly they make him look not so bad. It's kind of a strange coincidence that comes out of being near Boris Johnson, it would appear. Um, now, we did say in the cell to this programme, and you've mentioned it, Kevin, that this has brought claims of Tory hypocrisy onto the party, but there's not much these days that doesn't, to be fair. Um, and to be entirely fair, one of those Nicks found, David Trudinick, stood down from Parliament in 2019, so it's, it's quite historic. And when it comes to flipping, you know... But we're just changing their second home designations for one reason or another. Labour politicians did that just as much as the Tories during the expenses scandal. There may be some in the Labour Party who've got the same questions to answer that Nick's asking the Tories here. Yeah, you're, you're quite you're quite right. Like, go back to the expenses scandal in, in 2009. Uh, those cases that kind of made the headlines about duck houses and moats for Tory, but can't remember the exact number of Labour MPs who went to prison. It might, I think it was five or six, including one who was falsifying mortgage payments. Yeah, he paid off his mortgage and was falsifying statements to put into expenses, pretending to still claim a mortgage. So, yeah, ab no, absolutely. A couple of Tory peers also went to, to prison. So you know, Labour had dirty hands back then. But the reason this is relevant and you're quite right there would have been labor mps in the past who could buy a house claim the mortgage tax relief then they could sell it and pocket the gains and there would be questions did they pay capital gains tax but the reason this is relevant now is the tories are asking the questions of angela reyna well if you're asking the questions about the angela Rayner, let's put your own house in order let's look at your own house let's see if you're sorted you ask your own people get them to tell now i all four may well have paid capital gains tax. I, I'm not suggesting any wrongdoing by them at all. What I am saying is why will they not answer the questions when they're saying Angela Rayner must? Exactly. Is the produce the evidence as well. Produce is, the evidence. Is that principle as well? If you're relying on the fact that politicians don't have to talk about it, then politicians don't have to talk about it. You have yeah. to, you can't say it's one rule for them and one rule for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. Now, these are the ones, these four, who refuse to answer the question. I'm sure, I don't know, but I'm sure that Nick will have had more on his list who did give him good reasons, who did have an answer, who who therefore, you know, didn't get included in the published story because fine, you know, you did the right thing and you were honest. But it just sort of all adds up, doesn't it? It's the sort of current, the Tory brand we've got at the moment. It used to be the party of fiscal responsibility, hard work, pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of thing, grammar school boys. And now we've got this, this sort of sense of a party that's been corrupted by power, yeah. but in there too long, there's this whiff of decay and decline and rot just from the feet up and the head down. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be a few more Tories? I mean, perhaps even some in the cabinet who'll be feeling a bit itchy about where this investigation might go next. I'm sure this isn't all Nick's got in his notebook. Yeah, I, I think it was always a myth that the Tories were the party of fiscal responsibility and pulling themselves up by the, the bootstraps. Uh, I just uh, name uh, David Cameron, uh, Rishi very rough Stunat, start, married very an heiress. Rough yeah, anyway, anyway <laughs> I guess, you know, a, a national debt is uh, about two and a half times now what they inherited in uh, 2010. Right, but um, there, will, there are some cabinet ministers who are very uneasy about their hounding of... Uh, of, of Angela Rayner, because you know, they, they know her. They know her story. Uh, they also feel that you know Michael Ashcroft, Lord Ashcroft, a billionaire, own controversial tax affairs. Is he still a non-dom? 
if he's making some allegations, that's wrong. The Daily Mail, Mail on Sunday, have picked it up. Their owner is believed to be a non-dom, and they're registered in tax havens to avoid fair, what I would consider fair dues in this country. So the people chucking the tomatoes, the rotten tomatoes, are Angela Rayner. Uh, you know, they, they certainly haven't got uh, got clean clean hands. Doing, but what some stories do say, though, is Foxy that <coughs> excuse me, Angela Rayner was always quick for other people calling for Tories to uh, quit when they were facing accusations rather than had been found guilty of anything. And that can boomerang on you as a as a politician. Yeah, it doesn't always land well, does it? So I suppose that, I mean, what do you think, everybody? Do you do you think, do you think this is damaging Angela Rayner? Do you think this is, um, you know, more of an issue for her? Is it going to affect whether or not you vote Labour or Tory at the next election? Is it something that perhaps you expect the Tory party, but you don't expect the Labour party? Although, if, you know, if Labour have done anything wrong here, it's just, it's tiny, tiny amounts compared to the millions that Tories might be involved with. Sean says Tories are trying to find dirt and Angela when they're filthy themselves. Mm. That has this kind of sense that oh, all of Westminster is corrupt when they're not really. But I suppose the question is where where we go next with this, Kevin. You know, can the can the Tories keep on refusing to comment if if Nick or the Mirror or other people keep asking these questions? Because I'm sure they'll be asking in the lobby briefing today of Prime Minister's spokesman about this, and and it'll be keep going on a bit. Can a Mirror investigation really have the same kind of impact? I mean, it doesn't come in a book written by a Tory billionaire donor. You know, that's just not going to have. Will it perhaps make I don't know the Daily Mail just go a little bit quieter? They've been screaming for Angela's scalp for weeks. If there, you know, if there's another paper that's going, well, hang on, the Tories are actually quite significant. They may be worse. Oh, yeah. Is that going to make the mail calm down a bit? I mean, where do we go next? No, they're going to look at it very one-eyed, I think, and then see what they uh, what they want. They have got a bit quiet on anyway because they were looking, uh, quite frankly, deranged uh, the length of time they were uh, putting it on their front page. But of course, her fate now is in the in the hands of the Greater Manchester Police inquiry and then whatever the crown prosecution service judge i would uh, i would say but in a, in terms of a police inquiry you get you've got the person who bought the, who lives in the house now and bought it from you know the person who bought it from angela rayner saying look i still get post for her so of course she lived here you know she moved out nine years ago i'm still getting post uh, uh uh, for her, but then you get other neighbours saying no, she was never around, she was elsewhere, and so on. I think if she turns up to the Greater Manchester uh, Police Inquiry, which you know, I would have thought they have better things to do, about a dozen coppers on this case, it's utterly ludicrous and disproportionate. She turns up with from those years when she owned that house, she turns up with a council tax bill, a water bill, a gas electricity bill, uh, insurance bill, all showing her name on that property, paying those bills. And I would have thought it's just shut, just you know, just yeah. leave it out unless you unless you're really just hounding at and you're just determined to nail somebody, no matter what the lack of evidence is. Yeah, and to be fair, even if they they did find somehow against Angela, I mean, she said that she would stand down if uh, if she was found to have done anything wrong. But it's going to be a piddling amount <coughs> in yeah, the great scheme of things. But if you say you're going to stand down, you know, she she must have been pretty confident of a of a, mm -hmm. a position to say that, because if you're found some uh, little breach, you're right, it might be a piddling amount, but then you're gone. Uh, yeah. that, that's that's why I think she must be very very confident. I think uh, to be, just before we move on to good news, I think it's one of those signs, really, like we've got now this this part like saying decline and decay, that fan de siècle kind of end of an era, really, what we've got going on with the Tory party at the moment. But if they're spending so much time throwing dirt at Natalie Elphick, throwing dirt at Angela Rayner, it just indicates it's not a party that's confident in itself, that's that feels like it's still going to keep power. Rishi Sunak seems to be the only person blindly saying everything's fine, yeah. everything's fine. But it's this an old reactions yeah. of a party on its way out, isn't it? It's, a, it's an old tactic of the conservatives uh, uh, and the right in general, and parts of the left. It's got to be say is you just say all politicians are the same, all parties are the same. Doesn't matter what you do. Uh, when I, I think that's the case, so, look, there are, I think there are uh, decent, upstanding conservatives I, I know who I disagree with, but I think they're publicly spirited and and clean, and the others are sleazy. And then there are some Labour people uh, I'd, I'd cross the road to avoid.
Mm. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's one of the things I always say to my journalism students. Doesn't matter how you vote now. Once you actually go and speak to some politicians and interview them and actually get to know them and everything else, you're an entirely different way of looking at the world. Yeah, yeah. It's not quite as black and white as you might think. Yeah. Uh, perhaps there's one or two people camped out on campuses right now who could bear that in mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that. Um, we're going to talk about some good news out now. We have found some in the world for you. And here it is. <laughs> Now, in this bit of the show, we like to focus on uh, sort of the uplifting bits of human endeavour. And today it is not about the guy pictured here in the top right of the page, 55-year-old uh, John Birtle, who has climbed all 180 mountains in England, Wales and Ireland for no particular reason other than that he felt like it. Today is about his Jack Russell Bentley, who uncomplainingly, on teeny tiny little legs, climbed all 180 of those mountains with him just because his master was going up there and he wanted to be next to him. I think that's just the most amazing thing in the world. Kevin, is this proof that no matter how mad the behaviour of humankind, um, you know, our best friend is always voluntarily going to be right there enjoying it next to us? Yeah, they're, they're, well, they all say in politics, if you want a friend, get a dog. And... Uh... <laughs> You know, this this dog uh, is is kind of a, it's it's clearly it's clearly enjoyed it or he wouldn't have uh, he wouldn't have been able to get it up so many mountains. I think it's absolutely wonderful, a fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I think when it's a Jack Russell, it's the equivalent of climbing Everest. It's not just like a, a small fell in Cumbria. This is massive. Are you a little tiny Jack Russell. Because I think you can only do it with a small dog. Wasn't there somebody recently with the same Bernard or something trying to get up a mountain and had to be taken down by the uh, the rescue team because they're just too big? Well. Yeah, these these are Duracell battery dogs, aren't they? They just go and go and go on. And uh, yeah, as somebody who likes, cl yeah, climbing mountains, my my uh, myself, you do see people with their dogs, and the dogs are normally just very very happy. And there, there there is before anyone says, they're almost all responsible uh, dog owners, and they put them on a lead when there's wildlife, when there's sheep and so on uh, around and exactly. the, the lower hills. Yeah, but these ones are Jack Russell. You can pick it up and carry it with you if it gets a bit tired. St. Bernard, you have to call Mountain Rescue because <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm not getting this one down. I've got a big collie. Where if he gets a bit tired up a mountain, that's it. I'm going to just push him off. <laughs> but it just goes to show, which I've often said in this show, dogs are superior to cats. There's no way a cat would have gone up a hundred, one mountain, never mind 180, just to be with their owner. So, oh, dear, so competitive, sorry. aren't you? You know. Cats just wouldn't do that. Cats not as dedicated. Uh, right. Thank you, Kevin, for taking us through all that. Thank you, Bentley. Thank you, well done for giving us some faith in something other than human beings for once. Um, and we will see you. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. We will see you all again on Wednesday for another edition of the News Agenda. Until then, everyone, stay safe. Tassie, bye. <laughs>